Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm an airline pilot and today I want to cover a very interesting topic and that is what does a pilot simulator assessment as part of the airline pilot recruitment typically look like? Now the content of today's video is not made after any specific assessment but I've done quite a couple of them over the course of my career and so I just want to show you what like an average simulator assessment looks like. Basically, they are all the same with some minor variations. Let's start with the general layout and what's going to happen in general. Most assessments are typically either on the Boeing 737 or the Airbus A320. Now, that is unless you are being hired as a direct entry pilot who is type rated already. In that case, the assessment would usually be done on the type that you are rated on. Most assessments cover basically two parts. One of them is the raw data flying skills and that's the one that is always going to be done. If you are type rated on the type in question, you are usually also going to get some non-normal scenarios and in case of captains, often even a line-oriented flight training where you will be operating a normal line flight and then they throw some abnormal situations at you. But for today's scenario, we're here, we are not type rated on the airplane in question, and we will have gotten some sort of a pre-course study pack that will include stuff like the fam familiarization with the charts in use and pitch power values of the airplane in use and stuff like that. So you will have gotten some basic information about your airplane, like the pitch power values, a typical takeoff schedule, a typical landing schedule, and the speeds, and stuff like that. Alright, from here on, it is normally up to the pilot to pick in which seat he wants to sit. Now this is especially a thing with cadet pilots coming right from flight school, since many of them will have done their training in the multi-crew cooperation course on the left seat, others on the right seat, so basically the pilot gets to choose which seat he wants to sit on. Now, in our case, since most flight simmers are used to flying from the captain's seat, that is what we are going to take. Now let's talk about the actual scenario. So, some airlines inform their applicants of what might be expected. For example, some might say you can expect a raw data sit, some air work, then a holding and a raw data approach, followed by a go-around, and then a non-precision approach, also raw data for landing. That is like the typical profile that all airlines are going to put you through. Some airlines tell you in advance, others don't, but it's basically always the same. Now, in our case, we have not been informed of any airport before, but here we are, we enter the simulator, we look outside, and we go like, oh, that looks familiar, yeah, that's Düsseldorf where we are. And at that moment, the instructors will normally tell you, okay, welcome to Düsseldorf Airport. You're sitting here in your Boeing 737-800, the gross weight is 60 tons, we have loaded everything up. Now, many would typically put a fuel freeze on, so that the weight doesn't change throughout the course of all the exercises. In the simulator we can't do that, so I've just loaded 6 tons of fuel on board, starting at 61 tons, so that we are around about close to 60, which is a typical 737 weight. Now here is our first task at hand. We are going to depart raw data on a standard instrument departure. And in our case, we have the Germinghausen 9 Tango departure. Now it's going to be up to us as the pilot to set it up the way we like and to conduct a briefing. So we, we are going to start with the setup of the standard departure. We're departing from 2-3 left, go straight ahead to 4.5 dB Düsseldorf, left turn heading 173 until 21.5 miles from November Victor Oscar, which we have down here. And then it is going to be a left hand turn onto the radial 265 in Mount 2 Germinghausen. And that is basically the setup that we have. It is always worth it to have a look at the textual description to be sure that you didn't accidentally misinterpret something on the visual representation of the departure. So in our case, bearing 229, 
or actually bearing 232 from runway 23 left towards Delta Yankee at 4.5 to New Düsseldorf, turn left, 173 heading to Nervenich, turn left, intercept radial in Mount to Germinghausen. Okay, so now we can start with the setup. In general, you will only get your navigation display in the um, VOR and the approach modes. So you can use either this or this. And depending on the airline, they may allow you to use the expanded mode or only to use the complete compass mode. So that is really up to the airline. Some, some do this, others do that. In our case, we're going to use the um, full mode primarily, but we may be switching around as we like. So our departure initially is towards Delta Yankee NDB, so we can start by tuning that to 84.5. And here it is, 284.5. And, and that obviously means we will need our ADF. So that's this. Then at 4.5 dB Düsseldorf, we need to make that left hand turn, so we can tune Düsseldorf in the number 2 radial, 1515. Here we go, 1515. And then we make a left hand turn heading 173 until 21.5 Nervenich or radial 270 from Gerlinghausen. Personally, I prefer to use the Nervenich radial here because that means I can set up my inbound to Gerlinghausen. So 116.2 active in NAV1. Then we will need to navigate towards Gerlinghausen so we can tune that 15.4 in the number one standby. And then, just in case they are naughty and insert the failure of my number 2 radio, I'm also going to pre-program the frequency of Nervenich VOR in there. Okay, that's basically our NAV setup for the courses. We are going to insert 232 on the right hand side to track outbound. Or, you know what, we're going to make our life easy. We're going to insert 173 as a reminder of our first heading once we're airborne. So 173 in there, and then 085 on the left-hand side. Like this. Okay, and with that, we are pretty much prepared for our departure. Quick check on the nav aids. Dusseldorf is there and identified. And the rest of it we're only going to receive once we're airborne, even though we already got the Nervenich identifier. So that well, okay, and that is basically our NAV setup. Now let's talk about what we get in terms of assistance from our instructors and from our check captains and what we have to do ourselves. Generally, they will try to act as a support role for you. So in other words, that means they are going to provide things like they can tune your radios, they can set your courses, they can, well, handle the gear, handle the flaps and stuff like that. But they will not do any call outs for you when you are approaching a limit or when you're exceeding a limit. So one check captain actually said to me once that, well, imagine that I'm your best possible first officer but I'm having a very very bad day and I'm going to miss and miss and miss a lot of things and um, that is the basic scenario from which we started okay apart from that we are basically ready to go and this is our setup completed now let's quickly talk about our limits that we should set for ourselves some airlines are going to give you a booklet that is going to tell you the limits within which they want you to operate. Other airlines are not going to do that. Now, we can generally assume that we have the typical ATPL limits. So that is for your ATPL exam, maintaining the altitude within 100 feet, maintaining your heading, your heading within 5 degrees, when you're flying on both engines and within 10 degrees when you're flying on single engine and maintaining your speed plus 10 or minus 5 knots from the target speed. Now a quick word over here. 
In real life, it is a bit easier to maintain all the numbers precisely than it is in Microsoft Flight Simulator due to the simple fact that we're working with desktop hardware over here. So if I'm exceeding some of those values or some of those limits in the simulator, then I would not necessarily consider that an immediate fail, but I would more consider it as, well, just the imperfections of our flight simulator involved. Apart from that, most check captains are going to be able to maintain straight and level flight for you. Obviously, the autopilot is going to be inoperative and the flight directors are not available for you throughout the course of the flight. Well, and that pretty much completes our briefing. Now, typically in advance of the simulator session, the instructors, are, or rather the examiners, are going to give you a verbal briefing, telling you what's going to happen, what they plan to do, obviously not while giving you any hints as to what exactly to expect. So they are just going to brief you for what you can expect roughly and what they can do to help you, what they cannot do and things like this. In all cases, the atmosphere has been absolutely excellent. So I've never had any simulator assessment where I would have said that I felt uncomfortable or anything the likes. They are really doing the very best to help you out and they absolutely want everybody to pass. Obviously, it is up to you in the end if you're going to pass or not. Okay, before we're going to depart, I would absolutely recommend you to have a look into my manual flight videos in order for some tips and tricks as to how to fly the 737 manually. But in this video, I'm not going to explain everything as it happens, but I'm going to show you what might be asked from you in your airline simulator assessments. So, with that, we're pretty much done. We can do a little briefing for ourselves. Typically, I find those briefings a little bit useless in the sim because you cannot do your normal airline briefing because you have nothing in the FMC and stuff like that. And... On the other end side you well I've never been the type to do an extensive briefing in the sim however what I normally did is just a quick review of the departure so to do that threats for the departure well obviously that's going to be the stress due to the assessment situation so in order to manage that we are going to take things slowly if there's anything that we're unsure about just take things slow. If any exercise goes wrong, don't dwell on it, but simply carry on. And normally you're not going to fail for a single failed exercise. They will make you do it again if, you if they like the rest of what they've seen, and that's going to be it. Okay, so for the takeoff, we have a flap 5 takeoff, and we will have to set the thrust manually. We're going to use 90% and 1%. Takeoff speeds 131, 133, 145, and that is pre-selected on here. And we can switch off the auto throttle as we will not be allowed to use that. Okay, and that's pretty much our setup completed. For our standard departure, we proceed straight ahead towards Delta Yankee NDB, which is selected active to a 4.5, and we proceed towards that. At 4.5 dB from Delta Uniform Sierra, make a left turn heading 173 till 21.5 dB Nürburgring, which is selected on the number 1, so we're going to see it over here. By the time we pass that, we'll start the left-hand turn, and then we'll switch the um, Germinghausen VOR active on number 1. And we will be able to track and mount on here. Okay, that is pretty much it. Any questions? No? Very good. Then we are all set to go. Okay, takeoff clearance is received and off we go. Timing, timing. Stabilized, set takeoff thrust. Okay, take off thrust set, indications normal. Eight knots, checked. Okay. 
positive rate of climb. You're up. Okay, we're up on, we're receiving the NDB. So we've got the NDB up there. Thousand AGL, buck up. We go to 20. Okay, flaps one. Speed checked. And flaps up. Oh, a tiny bit to the left there, tracking towards the NDB. We can also quickly set our climb thrust here. Let's use 85%. Roughly, here we go. Okay, we're at 4.5 DME, so turn left, heading 173. I would instruct our, the check captain to set all those values for us, of course. And we're approaching the target altitude, so... Let's pitch down a little bit, that we don't approach it too quickly. 1000 feet a minute normally looks quite good. And here we go, heading 173. Okay, we continue on this until 21.5 DME from November Victor Oscar. And here we go, 21.5. Start the left hand turn and level off. Here we go, okay, 60% is roughly what we need for level flight, so let's select that, and then we can also switch over our VOR in order to track our radial inbound. Okay, might need a little bit of an intercept heading here, like this. Okay, and in the meantime, we can do the after takeoff checklist. Don't expect me to do too much system handling today. This is uh, mostly going to be a video on um, the flight procedures. And many examiners are actually going to tell you that they don't want to see you doing any system handling. Many will tell you, just ask for the checklist that you want. And I'm just going to reply checklist completed and that's going to be it. Because they really want to see that you can fly your aircraft. And that is the part that they're interested in. Okay, and we are established on the radial 265 inbound Gamminghausen VOR. Perfect. So from this point, they've seen that you can fly a standard instrument departure. They will normally ask you to do some sort of air work. In many cases, that is going to include a steep turn, which in airline language means a turn at 45 degrees angle of bank. So why don't we go ahead and do the very same? We're going to start at 45 degrees bank to the left at 180 degrees. So our heading is pre-selected here. We basically want to fly down to the other end of the needle while maintaining our altitude. 
A good tip over here is that in the turn you will need a couple percent more N1 due to the extra wing loading that you have while maintaining your altitude. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. Ready to go? 3, 2, 1, 45 degrees. Bank to the left. Okay, passing 30. I'm Bank adding angle. a bit of thrust there. Bank angle. Bank and here we go. Bank angle. Bank angle. Bank angle, bank angle. So this is exactly what things have to look like. The pitch is frozen in position. Basically all the numbers are frozen in position. And as we go out of the turn we need to reduce thrust again a little bit and pitch down a bit in order to avoid climbing away. Here we go, thrust back to 60%, like this, and that's it. So let's do the same into the other direction. Going through 30%, a bit more thrust. And here we go. Okay, and here we are. Okay, nice. Now that we're back on the original course, make sure to reset your thrusts to the standard needed for your aircraft type. And now, what instructors really like to do, they put you into an active pause and freeze your simulator into position. And they want to show, or they want you to show them exactly where you are on your chart so that they can check your situational awareness. So, for us, that's an easy task. We've got this little VR tuned over there. We're 8 miles out on a 140 radial. So we've got this little off. We've got a 140 radial that's going to be somewhere over here. And about 8 miles. So we're about here. And that is normally all they want to see from you. So with that, this exercise is completed already. Okay, the simulator is unpaused, we can continue our exercises. Now, during the active pause I lost a little bit of speed, going to correct for that. And here is going to be an interesting one. This is basically the top of the instrument scanning level. I've never actually seen this in an airline assessment, but I have heard of it happening and I did practice it in my multi-pilot um, course. So here's the trick. They want you to climb or descend 1,000 feet within one minute and turn 180 degrees. Or in other words, they might ask you to make a 360 degree turn and climb 2,000 feet in exactly two minutes. Now, in order to do that, we actually need to reduce our speed a little bit so that's the first thing they might ask you and keep in mind in order to do a standard rate turn you have two minutes for the turn but the maximum speed you can take is 180 knots on that otherwise you will need excessive bank so when they ask you about that tell them okay then i need to reduce speed to 180 so that is what we are going to do here we go speed 180 let's reduce our speed while at the same time maintaining our altitude which is another exercise that they really love to see which is accelerating and decelerating in level flight to see that you're able to maintain that level flight okay flaps one and flaps two And you want to be precise, so let's go flap 5. 
we go. Oh, roughly 60% and 5 degrees pitch. A little bit more maybe, but this seems to work quite well. Okay, so here's the exercise. We can reset our timer, and now the trick is to fly exactly a thousand feet a minute, or in some cases they even ask you to climb only a thousand feet in that time, so then you need to do 500 feet a minute, which is even more difficult in a jet. So let's go ahead and do just that. We're gonna make it a left hand turn, we'll need 25 degrees angle of bank and we'll need, uh, let's make it a climb of 1000 feet so we'll need a rate of climb of 500 feet a minute here to make the exercise a little bit more challenging. Okay then, our course is set, you can very nicely use those 45 degree markers over here in order to set yourself some aid over there. Basically, you want to cover 45 degrees every 15 seconds. Am I right there? Am I just calculating that correctly in my head? Yeah, I guess I am. So let's go ahead with it. You have basically 15 seconds for every one of them. And then 250 feet of climb in every uh, 15 seconds. Actually, every 30 seconds. Okay. Now that we know the numbers, we can start the exercise. And keep in mind, your speed needs to be um, right on point through the, uh, the entire exercise. Okay. 3, 2, 1, start. So, oh, 500 feet a minute. It's quite difficult to maintain in a jet aircraft because they are really not built for this kind of stuff. Okay, so we've got the first 20 seconds, so we're lagging behind a little bit there in terms of the bank. 30 seconds, 250 feet, a little bit behind on the bank. Forty five seconds and still behind on the bank. Okay, one minute on altitude, a bit behind on the bank. The reason we are behind on the bank is of course because by the time we started the we started the timer, it took us a couple seconds to get our bank angle. And we have to make up for that. Okay, 1 minute 30 and we are almost there in terms of the bank. We are a little bit high right now. But we are slowly but steadily getting back on course. Okay, 15 seconds to go, don't climb too quickly and don't ask me what that white box is that shows sometimes. But that is really distracting me. Okay, we're at the altitude 2 seconds early and we that's 2 minutes and we are just a tiny bit behind on the heading. So that is normally still acceptable. We can do the same exercise the other way around and do it in a descent. So let's do that. 3, 2, 1, off we go. So 500 feet a minute rate of descent. We are looking for 30 degrees angle of bank. Okay, 15 seconds. We are a bit low at the moment. So we can correct for that. Okay, now we're definitely running a bit low. And 30 seconds, we are on the heading. 
Disregard the master caution, that's just going to be the off-schedule descent. Speed is checked correcting. Okay, running a little bit low, but we are good on the heading. So we'll continue the descent. 25 degrees angular back is what we need. We have 15 seconds. We are spot on with the heading. But my altitude management is not that good this time. Really not that good this time. Okay, 30 seconds. Heading looks good. Altitude is a little bit low still. So heading is good, altitude a tiny bit too low. Okay, and here we are. So that is definitely an exercise. Um, the descent wasn't that good, but it would not probably still have been all in limits. So from here on, we will do another piece of air work, which is going to be accelerating towards 300 knots and then decelerating back towards 220. So, let's set our target of 300 knots. Like this. So, maintain the altitude while accelerating. I'm going to use 90% of thrust. Flap 1. And maintain our heading 085. Flaps up. In this exercise, basically, they want to see that you're able to control the aircraft while you are accelerating the plane and decelerating the plane. Okay, approaching 300 knots, let's set some 75% or so. That should hopefully be good in order to um, maintain our speed. And that looks fairly good indeed. Okay, from here back towards 220 knots. And we can proceed direct Bravo Alpha mic VOR. Which is a frequency of 114.0. As you can see here on our approach chart. Oh, and don't climb away. Okay, 114.0. While decelerating and maintaining the altitude at the same time. The challenge is on, let's go. Obviously, I'll bring it back towards 5,000 feet. Like this. In terms of the altitude, in case you're not maintaining it accurately, what they want to see is that you're doing a positive correction. So, they don't want you to, you know, forget about the altitude for a longer time and see you deviating from the altitude for a longer time. But indeed what they want to see is that you notice in case you deviate and that you correct for it within a reasonable amount of time.
And here we go, flying towards the VOR. So 60% and one is roughly what we need. Five degrees of pitch. And yeah, please ignore those white boxes around the screens. Um, they seem to have been introduced with the aircraft and avionics update. I don't really know where they come from. My apologies for those. Okay, here we go. We can do one more acceleration and one more deceleration. But what they also like to do from time to time is they just tell you to completely let go of all the controls. So I'm letting go of everything right now. And the plane is roughly maintaining where it is at the moment. Okay, let's jump forward a little bit and pretend that our instructors have just repositioned us. At this point, they might tell us something like this. Boeing 1, proceed direct Bravo Alpha Mike VOR and join the holding overhead Bravo Alpha Mike. So we've already tuned that in VOR number 1, so we can start our turn towards Bravo Alpha Mike and then we need to figure out our holding. Again, we're going to ignore any master cautions as they are uh, from the off schedule descent light. So, starting our turn, we can see that we're going to end up somewhere in the region of uh, 250 inbound. 251 happens to be the inbound course from the holding, so we can simply go ahead and do a direct entry into the holding. Now, during the hold, we are going to set up for the standard ILS approach for runway 23 left at Düsseldorf. And we can expect to fly that into a missed approach. This is going to be a lot of work at the same time, and that is pretty much what they want to see of you. That you are able to fly the airplane, while at the same time setting up for an approach. So here we go, heading towards Bravo Alpha Mike. Once again, checking the course over here, and this is definitely going to be a direct entry. Left hand turns, one minute lag time, minimum holding altitude 3000 feet. So that sounds about right to me. So that is what we are going to do. I'm going to start the inbound turn, or sorry, the outbound turn, a tiny bit earlier, since we are a little bit ahead of the VOR. And we don't really want to overshoot anything, do we? Okay, so we'll start a mile prior to the VOR. And that should be all we need. We could do some mathematics there as well. We're currently doing 240 knots true airspeed. That is 4 miles a minute. So if you start one mile prior, that means we have 15 seconds. That should be just about enough in order to align ourselves with the station by the time we pass overhead. Let's cross-check if our mathematics was correct there. 30 degrees of bank. Here we go, overflying the station. So, resetting the timer, preparing for our downwind lag, or rather preparing for the timing of the downwind lag. We do not have any wind, so we don't need to do any wind correction there. At the same time while flying this, we can already have a first look into our approach. So, we've already got the ILS chart for runway 23 left open, and that is what we are going to follow. Basically, we leave BAM VOR on the radial 320 outbound until 5.8 DME, and then we make a left-hand turn onto the final approach. We are probably going to fly this into a go-around, so what checkers tend to do, you will fly go-around. The question is just, are you going to do it on the first or on the second approach? Now. Many of them do it on the first approach so that they can simply give you vectors around the airfield in order to re-intercept. So 
That is the one option. The other option is that they are just going to reposition you. But in most cases, I've gotten the go around on the first attempt there. So that is what we are about to do as well. We wait until the indication switches from from towards the two indication, like now. Start the timing, one minute lag time. And this we can basically use in order to start our setup. So at this point we could we could give control to the instructor or to the examiner so that he would fly the plane straight ahead but we would have to fly the inbound turn again. For us let's assume we give it to the instructor so we'll put it into control wheel steering mode make it fly straight ahead. Now we can go ahead and quickly start our setup. So 109.9 .9, and we put that on both sides. We're going to keep the inbound course over here. We can already select 232 on the other side. Here we go, 232. We're approaching the inbound turn. So let's go ahead and fly that turn first. We have control again. And here we go, one minute. If you can do some stuff while you're flying a turn, you are welcome to do, but do not mess up the turn. So fly the aircraft first, that is the most important aspect here. Once we're on the inbound leg into Bravo Alpha Mike, we can once again um, continue with our setup. So they definitely want to see that you're able to prioritize and flying the airplane is always going to come first. Okay, the radial comes alive. You should, in the best case, not overshoot this. And if a minor overshoot happens, it shouldn't be more than one dot. But if you've done everything right, you will end up basically exactly on the radial. Like so. Okay, here we go. Well established inbound. Let's reset our timing. Okay, let's give the con instructor control again. And then we can continue our setup. We're looking 338 at minimums. We go 338 and for the speeds it's going to be a flap 30 approach. So that is pre-selected. Okay, with that we are pretty much set up for our approach. So I have control and we can leave the holding whenever we feel ready and start the approach. I would say we feel ready right now. So let's go ahead and join the 320 outbound from Bravo Alpha Mike to start our approach. Here we go, 320. It's a little bit annoying that um, we cannot simply command everything to our instructor over here, but have to do stuff ourselves. So we're cleared for the approach. That means we can descend to an altitude of 3,000 feet. Here we go, set. 3,000 checked. And this is a little bit dynamic flying that I'm doing right now. That should obviously, obviously be a little bit smoother in the actual simulator assessment. Not a caution, ignoring that. And for the missed approach we need uh, 311 Lima MDB. Active. Okay. So approach review, or rather missed approach review, straight at 2.60 meter delta unit from Sierra, right and turn, heading 309 towards uh, Lima Mike Alpha. 
On to go, we can start our speed reduction. Also at 5.8 miles, we're going to start our inbound turn. Basically now. Okay, 232. Two. Like this, and the ILS can go active. Here we go. Slight overshoot, that is what I get for doing everything myself and constantly reaching out to all different places in the cockpit. But we're re-intercepting and that is what they want to see. Flaps 1, speed checked. So the go-around is going to be a little bit difficult to fly in the simulator because we just don't have everything inside as well as we have it on a real aircraft. Okay, flap 5. That. And we're intercepting the glide slope nicely. Do ask them if they want to see you fly a low drag approach or if they want to see you fly, you know, just back to final approach speed immediately. If the latter is okay, then I would absolutely recommend to do that as it is going to make your task easier. For us today, let's have a little bit of fun and we are going to start configuring at 4 miles just to make it a little bit more exciting. Okay, we can select our missed approach altitude, which is going to be 4,000 feet. And then again, straight at 2.6 from Delta Uniform Sierra, right hand turn. 309er in Montelima, Mike Alpha NDV. And we can already select the ADF active. And then right towards uh, Bottrop NDV on 060 outbound from Lima, Mike Alpha. Heading 232. And that is looking good. Okay, four miles, gear down, flap 15, landing checklist. Flaps 30. Checked. And landing checklist complete. So we need something around 56% and 1. And we are well established. In most cases the instructors are very nice and instruct the go around nice and early like right now. But since we are still somewhat fighting with the localizer they would probably let us keep flying until we're actually 100% stable on the localizer as well. Okay, the runway is blocked, go around. So, go around, flap 15, set go around thrust. That's 90%. Tune radios for Mr. Broach. They are already tuned.
So we continue on the on this track until either 2.8 from the ILS or 2.6 from the Uniform Sierra. We're going to choose the latter. Okay, back up. Flaps 5. Flaps 1. And flaps up. And here we go. Interesting that our numbers don't really match there. Actually, they do. Disregard. Okay, so 1.8 DME, we're looking for 2.6 from the uh, VOR down here. One to go, let's do a thousand feet a minute, get our thrust off a little bit. That's 2.6 miles. Right turn 309 inbounds to the NDB. So set heading 309. Here we go, 309. And here we are. Well, I'm going to keep climbing a little bit. That is certainly going to help. Very easy trick there with an NDB whenever you are flying inbound to an NDB. So the inbound needle here can only fall down and the aft part of the needle is always going to be dragged along. So that way I'm just about letting it fall down. And then when passing radial 279 from Dusseldorf VOR, which is still selected over here, 279 we're gonna make a right hand turn and at the same time speed 220 again. I meant to set that earlier, but I just didn't have enough hands. Okay, passing 270, so we're almost there. Almost uh, about to start our turn. And that's going to be a right-hand turn on to 060 outbound. Okay, approaching 279. In the meantime, we're on the QDM as well towards the NDB. Okay, then. 060 outbound. Which is set now. Okay, on an intercept heading here, waiting for the back of the needle to reach 060. And at the same time, this is gonna also going to be 060 in onto Bottrop, which is 406.5. So we can already tune that. Or rather, we can ask our instructor to tune that. Here we go, 406.5, active. And we're receiving that as well. Here we go. So once we're on 060 inbound, we're going to turn onto that track. And that is basically how we fly this mist approach. So I could have taken the turn a little bit wider, but then again, speed was 220, so at um, 25 degrees angular bank, 
in theory we should be fine, in practical terms we are more than often not, so for that reason we are just about um, correcting that little track there right now. Would probably more have been a case for a 10 degree angle or bank, but there's nothing about that written in the procedures description there, so we might as well fly it like this. Okay, the next one that we are going to fly is going to be the VOR approach. So let's start setting up for that. There we go, VOR runway 23 left. That's gonna be a 233 inbound course on Dusseldorf VOR 15.15. .15. And select that active. Okay, and here we are on the track towards Bravo Oscar Tango. So at this point, if you had if you have not flown a holding before in the simulator. You would probably fly one now, because there is a holding published here at the end of the missed approach. If you have already flown a holding, then chances are good that the instructor is just going to say, okay, put it into flight freeze so that you are frozen in position, and then you can quickly do your setup like this. Now we are going to do it with a flight freeze because it's going to be a little bit easier for us here in a single pilot environment so that we can quickly set up. We need our minimums of 700 feet there. We need um, the missed approach, Lima NDB once again, which is in the standby. We have Dusseldorf VOR active on both sides and we still need the NDB over here. So that is basically our setup completed already. Okay, unfreeze. And now we can do our briefing. Important thing here, normally you're going to do your briefings while you are flying the airplane at the same time, because they want to see that you have the mental capacity to actually do so. So for that reason, that is what we are doing over here as well. So let's go ahead and brief the approach. This is going to be the VOR approach, runway 23 left at Düsseldorf. Frequency 115.15 is active number one, active number two, and our final approach course 233 is pre-selected. Um, what else are we going to do? We leave the Bottrop NDB on 172 outbound, minimum altitude 3000 feet for that, and we will join the final approach course 233. Final approach fix is at 10.1 DME from the VOR, 3 degree glide path, we have some check altitudes on the chart up here, and we're going to fly the entire thing at 140 knots, which is going to provide us with a rate of descent at 750 feet per minute. And that should be mostly it. Okay, apart from that, nothing more to do or to say really. Um, missed approach is straight at 2.7 DME from Düsseldorf, so 0.1 DME more than we've previously flown. Right hand turn 309 in Mount Lima NDB and then 060 inbound Bottrop NDB. Disregarding that. And that's it. Any questions? No? Okay, very good. At this point, instructors like to cut things short, so right hand turn heading 020, please. and descent altitude 3000. And here we go.
At this moment, it's crucial for us to keep situational awareness. So we've got our VOR over here and we know roughly where we are, 15 miles out on a 030 radial, so that's 030, 15 miles, we are roughly here, flying on 140, so like this. So we're going to intercept somewhere around 14 or 15, 13 miles out. So that is something for us to keep in mind, that we are mentally prepared by the time we get our final vector. Okay, about to level off. So 60% and 1. And here we go. Okay, let's quickly re-enter the approach speed. This time we're going to do a flap 40 approach. Like this. Okay, turn right, heading 200, cleared VOR approach, runway 23 left. Let's start getting our speed down. In the best case, by the moment we reach our descent point, we want to be at the final configuration, so that we can fly the entire procedure with a constant rate of descent. So, flaps 1. There we go. And... Missed that heading by a couple degrees. That's when everything happens at the same time. Flaps 5. But here we've got everything under control again, and that is basically what they want to see. If you mess up temporarily, it's usually not a problem, as long as you notice and correct for it. So the descent point is at 10.1. That means we're two miles from our descent point, gear down, flap 15, and we are approaching the radial, so set heading 233. Like so, flaps 25. Oh boy, this is a lot of uh, doing stuff at the same time. Yeah, correcting. As always, fly the aircraft first. Here we go. I was probably a little overreactive of the simulation. Okay, here we are. 10.1 miles, starting the descent. We're looking for about 0 degrees pitch in a 737-800. So, now we can ask our instructor to read us the distance versus altitude checks. So, at 9 miles, we're looking for 2,640. We're at 9 miles, 2,740, so we're at 100 high at the moment. Well, that is because our intercept was messed up a little bit, but not much of a problem. We can simply continue like this. As long as we're only above the path and not below it, things are kind of alright. So, 8 miles, 2,330. Eight miles, and we are like 70 feet high. So, seven miles should be 2010. Not more than a thousand feet a minute here. Seven miles, 50 feet high. Six miles, 1690. Okay, 6 miles and we are on glide, so we need 750 feet a minute rate of descent, like so, and at 5 miles we're looking at 1370. So 5 miles, 10 feet low. 
Next up, four miles, 1,050. 1,000. Correct. So, oh, four miles on glide. Three miles, 730. Continue. Okay, a little bit offset, that is expected. Three red on, uh, sorry, three white on the puppies, correcting for that. Okay, back on puppy. And all visual because the puppy's incorrect at the airport over here in the sim. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Okay, right on the marker. Exactly as it should be. Speed break up, thrust was normal. And then we can stop it on the runway. Okay, parking brake set, and that is your simulator screening over. So, typically, most instructors are going to ask you, so what do you think, how do you judge your flying? Now, that's going to be probably the hardest question, because it is a good part of your final outcome of the assessment, to be able to judge your own flying and to do your own self-critique and to judge yourself accurately. If you've done some mistakes, no problem. But it certainly helps if you've noticed your own mistakes. So let's go about it. Well, I would say our flying was actually quite all right. We caught most deviations quickly and corrected for them and we haven't deviated too often. However, what was definitely a little bit of a problem there was our intercept for the non-precision approach that we have just flown. So I would say that um, airspeed low call we got there was definitely something that uh, should not have happened. And for that reason, we I sacrificed a little bit of altitude because we were above the MSA. The sector MSA was 2,400 feet. Now let's quickly check if that is actually correct. Yes, it was, 2,400 on the extended center line. So we stayed above the MSA, and in that point, correcting the speed definitely had priority. So part of the reason why that happened was definitely because of Microsoft Flight Simulator, because um, when you look back at that scenario, you saw the um, speed tapes, the upper and the lower part, touch themselves. And that's something that you something that would not have happened in a real 737. So that was certainly um, neither in a real full flight simulator, by the way, in a scenario like this. So that was definitely something where the uh, simulator played a role and where the simulator acted up as well. But we went through it. We climbed back to our platform altitude just by the final approach fix. For that reason, we got a little bit high on the initial part of the non-precision. But we descended at roughly a thousand feet a minute to catch that one back and we re-intercepted. So like that, we caught our path again and we came back on profile. And in the end, we ended up stable through the gate. Now, finally, I forgot that I had set my uh, cloud ceilings a little bit too low. For that reason, you saw me go into the weather dialog there and quickly reset the weather scenario so that we... Um, got clear skies and could continue our approach. 
Apart from that, I would say there were no major blunders in here. Now, I would say that things were not flown perfectly. So if you ask me on a scale of 1 to 10, how did I do? And you need at least 6 in order to pass. I would give myself an 8. There was definitely room for improvement. That's out of question. But um, it certainly wasn't bad either. So I would say 8 out of 10. And in that situation, there is two possible answers that you're going to get from the instructor. Either we fully agree, congratulations, or we're not allowed to give you an answer yet. You will be notified by uh, email or by whatever in a day or two's time. Thank you very much for coming. And that's going to be it. The latter, by the way, is in no means um, an indication that you failed. Not at all. So, indeed, that was the case with my new employer. They were simply not allowed to tell me directly after the simulator. And a day later, I got the positive email. So, that is that. I do really hope that you've enjoyed this video. If you did, do let me know in the comments below. As said, I tried to cover as many possible scenarios as um, I could think of, but this was just an average session. It does not represent any particular airline or any particular uh, type of simulator screening. I would say this was pretty much a regular screening that you might encounter on the line or rather when applying for a typical standard airline. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you found this one interesting. If you did, do let me know in the comments below. Thank you very much. And as always, if you want to support the channel, like, comment, and subscribe. And if you really love what I'm doing, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link that you can find in the video description below, or to welcome you as a channel member, which is going to give you exclusive early access to new videos before they are released for everyone else. Thank you for watching and see you all again very soon.